And I'll join palms. And repeat after me. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Sangha. Keeping the palms joined. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. All you brave folks. <laughs> so spoiled in San Diego. You know, the 12 times a year that it rains, I always talk about that. But uh, thanks for, for showing up. Yeah, that's about all I got. You're free to go. <laughs> Why is this practice so difficult? Why is it so hard to be nice to people? Why is it so hard to be nice to yourself? And we only have an hour this morning, so. But, I don't know, a quick little thought. Why is it so difficult? Who wants to? It's just easier not to. Easier not to, that sums it up. And we do like easy, huh? I just started reading the book, Feed Your Demons. Ah. And, um, it seems to me that we spend an awful lot of time fighting against our demons, and the advice and the suggestion in this book is to stop fighting and start nurturing and feeding what's troubling or troublesome for you. And once that gets resolved, it's a lot easier to drop all of it and just yeah. proceed. Yeah. That's literally what I was trying to get through last Sunday. And people just looked at me like, what? You and know? I immediately went home and ordered the book. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> started reading. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, getting beyond the self-help therapy mindset of spending our whole life trying to fix things and actually doing good things. And then we feel less like shit. And then we feel less likely to have to fix things because we're actually nurturing the good things. Yeah. I think because I think I know what I want and I think I know what's going to make me happy and that and because I'm selfish and those things don't go towards being nice and kind to other people. Yeah, for sure. I think because it's always like the ego, you know, like life is suffering and we're, we're taught to chase happiness instead of just being present with what is and when we're suffering, we're, we're usually unkind because unkindness is just a reflection of how we're feeling internally. And I think when our minds race, we're just trying to have a sense of control when it just comes down to the fact that we don't have control and not having attachment to like whatever it is and going with what flows is the being. So it's like usually it's our ego and sense of control of life. Yeah. I don't know why I even sit here anymore. I mean, you've got all this stuff in your mouth. Yeah. I think sometimes it's just easier to accept a negative than it is a positive. It's way easier. And you can you can see it in the simple action of how people acknowledge like their experiences, whether it be at a restaurant or a hospitality type event, they're always willing to go at the negative right away and express that negative thought and put it out there on paper and smash somebody else for whatever else they did, but they're never willing to 
put out the good experience and give people the positive of what came about from something and almost never willing to share that. And that I think is also really challenging. And I feel like even like the a couple weekends ago, I'm hanging out with a few girlfriends and we've all suffered some losses and there's been like a lot of negative things happening in our lives lately. And so the whole night was so negative that then the following weekend, we're all like, we have to have a night together where we're not talking all this negative stuff. Why are we just like be talking about the happy things that have happened and sharing the happy moments with our spouses or the happy moments with our kids and reflecting on those versus all of the negative, but it seems like the negatives are so much easier to remember and reflect on. For sure. Yeah. I think as far as for myself as being, you know, hard on myself is because I do I make so many mistakes. Say, you know, I might run a red light. God, you're so stupid. Um, you say something wrong. God, you're so stupid. Why are you so stupid? And, and as many times a day as, as you tell yourself, it's stu- you're stupid, yeah. it's just hard on you. It's yeah. just hard on you, and it makes it easier to be unkind to other people. <coughs> For sure. <coughs> Simple solution is just stop making mistakes. <laughs> 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 you know, that make everything so much easier, right? right? Uh, anyone else want to share before we sit? It's also just giving a little time for those who might be coming. Rain. When you shared that about um, you know the negative kind of view, someone years ago I heard them talk about, and I thought this was a really good practice I did for a while. I haven't done it in a long time, but um, uh, I guess for me it just I'm not really there anymore. But uh, the example they gave was. Uh, when you go to a restaurant, just as one example, and you could do this anywhere, right? But you sit down and immediately the person or people you're with, or if you're by yourself, whatever, it's looking at what's wrong with the table, what's wrong with the silverware, what's wrong with the person serving you, what's wrong with the food, what's wrong with the people. It's this constant critiquing of everything that's in the space, as opposed to just flipping that to wow, it's a nice setup, a nice table, a nice glass, nice food, whatever it might be. But it's little practices like that that can begin to really alter the way we see. Because for me, Buddhist practice, and the last thing I'll say before we sit, it's a training. It's what it's meant to be there for. It's what it's meant to do. It's a training. It's a training to understand, yes, life is filled with suffering. Right? For those of you who are brand new, the first thing the Buddha taught is life is suffering. But it doesn't mean that all of life sucks. <laughs> and it doesn't just stop there. It's like, okay, life is suffering, but how do we come out of that? That's what he taught. And to come out of that suffering, it is a training of the mind. It's not an escaping. And it's training the mind to do little things like that. Like just shift our perspective, shift our perception, shift our views of a situation. Instead of complaining about everything that's in the restaurant, just be grateful that you're even able to get up and go to a restaurant, or grateful that you have enough money to be able to pay for the food, or grateful that you got food to eat, or grateful that you have company with somebody. Like, there's so many things to be positive about. But uh, we go into situations and it's that negative just default. So. Um, Glad you planned the second outing to shift it. And without any details, the second outing was much better? Yes. All right. <laughs> That's all I want to know. Um, so we'll start with the meditation practice. A couple things to tell you. To those who are joining virtually, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, let's see. <laughs> we were not brave enough to come out, but we're grateful to do the class online. Glad you're here, all of you. Um, so a couple things to tell you before we begin. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're not going to float away. You won't have any mystical, magical experiences. The mind won't shut off. It won't stop racing. It won't think nothing. You're not trying to empty your mind. You're not trying to go blank. We're just going to sit. We're going to breathe. You'll hear sounds. Sounds inside the room. Sounds outside. This is life. Life is filled with chaos. This practice is learning to get quiet and still within all of the chaos and learning to be with life as it is. <coughs> the posture. You just want to be comfortable. If you are on a cushion, up in the pelvis, slide in the front third, pushing the stomach forward. It allows the back to straighten. Shoulders are relaxed. If you're on a bench or chair, however you're seated, same thing, just trying to sit up straight. Hands on the knees or lap, relax the shoulders. I'll guide us as we begin. 
and we'll settle into a little bit of silence. Most important, do not expect anything. We're just going to sit and breathe. Starting with the eyes closed, if comfortable, or slightly open. Mouth is open or closed. We'll start with taking three deep breaths, slowly. Settle into a natural rhythm of the breath. Noticing the mind as it wanders, jumping from thought to thought. Start with gently guiding the attention, focus to the stomach or chest. Breathing in, feel them rise. Breathing out, they fall. Simply continue this practice, observing sensation of breath. Expecting nothing but to sit and breathe. <clears throat> As the mind wanders, lost in thought, recognize it, release that thought, return attention, focus to the breath.
Breathing in. Follow breath in. Breathing out. Follow breath out. Letting go of expectations. Letting go of judgments from the practice. Just sitting. Breathing.
Learning to be comfortable in stillness, in quiet, just sitting, breathing. The body still rested, and the speech quiet, aware of all sound, and the mind learning to settle. Know what it's like to just sit and breathe. Knowing with each breath there's nothing else to do. Nowhere else to go. And no one else to be. Everything beautiful, 
exactly as it is. Sitting, breathing. And once again, taking three deep breaths, slowly. Slowly open the eyes. Slowly beginning to move. The most important with the practice of meditation is to recognize how you feel now, immediately after. Compare this to how you typically feel throughout your day. Recognize the difference, if there is one. And ask yourselves how you prefer to feel every day for the rest of your life. And realize however you feel now, if it's quiet, calm, and still, or a busy mind, racing mind, whatever you're sitting with at this moment, it's nothing to do with anything I said. It's nothing to do with how you sit and hold the hands across the legs. It's nothing to do with the sounds around us or anything else for that matter. It's everything to do with your own mind and your own mind's reaction to an external condition. This is what the Buddha called Pratitya Samuppata, means dependent origination. This is the basis of the Buddha's awakening. The word Buddha simply means awaken. There's a human being no different than any one of us who began to understand why he suffered, why he got angry, sad, depressed, stressed, anxious. He began to understand the causal relationship of all phenomena. And what that means very simply for all of us, regardless of where you come from or what you believe in or where you think you're going, your whole life is filled with things that happen. You react. More stuff happens. More reactions. That's it. This practice is simply learning what it's like to respond to something quietly, peacefully, still. Because for most of us, the way you responded to the last 20 minutes is quite different from how you respond to every other 20 minute period of your day. And so all we're working on is closing the gap to the way you feel now is closer to how you feel always. Just as driven, motivated, productive, successful, whatever that means to you in your respective lives. But with a mind that's steady, clear, focused, distracted by nothing, disturbed by no one. This practice is not easy. It's not necessarily fun. It's not an escape, as often people think it is. It's direct perception into the present moment and being with life as it arises. If your life is a crazy, hectic, stressed out mess, meditation doesn't fix that. It creates space for you to begin to 
become aware of why your life is a crazy, hectic, stressed out mess so you can actually make changes in your life. This practice is about change. Changing you. It's not easy. That's not fun. Because most of our lives we've blamed everything on everybody else. And we thought if everybody else just changes, then I'll be okay. How's that working out for you so far? Meditation is free. Buddhist practice is free. It's just sitting, breathing, learning to be kind to yourself and everybody else you encounter every moment of your life. And that's it. Once we stop trying to change, fix, control, manipulate everything and everyone around us, and we work on changing our mind and our reaction to the world around us, life gets a little bit simpler, but ultimately not much changed. So we continue to practice, <coughs> we continue to become aware of what the mind does, the nature of the mind, what we think, what we say, and what we do. The Buddha called this karma. Karma is not getting what you deserve. Karma is not what goes around, comes around. Karma literally just means action. Karma is what we bring into the world with our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. So we become mindful of what we think and what we say and what we do because that creates our reality. That creates and triggers our emotions. And that's it. And that practice never changes. This practice never changes. It never becomes more complicated. It never becomes more advanced. There's no what's next. It's just every single day, every single moment, working on the intention behind your thoughts and words and actions. So, uh, with that, I'll pause. Uh, for me, I always just prefer to respond to questions, meditation, Buddhist <coughs> practice, um, anything you're sitting with. And again, to those who are joining virtually, welcome. Um, to our millions of YouTube followers, thanks for showing up. Uh, there's a chat box on your screen somewhere. Feel free to say hello, or if you have any questions, you can put them there, and I'll do my best to respond. Um, so we'll open up to questions. Can you define and give some <clears throat> insight around the middle path? Hmm. Yeah, so the question is, can I define or give some insight into the middle path or around the middle path? Um, yeah, the middle path in Buddhist practice is super critical. And I like to see it as something that's always evolving and, and moving. Uh, I'll start here. Not something that says so concrete as if the Buddha said, this is where the middle path is. Because that middle path is different for all of us, right? Um, one simple example is somebody may have 100 shirts and would probably do just fine with 50. But that doesn't mean that 50 is the amount of shirts that one should own according to Buddhist teachings, right? Somebody may only have 50 shirts, and then they'd be fine with just 25 or 35. It's not even, the middle path isn't about like cutting it in half. It's something that I think as a practice, and I'll come back to this in a minute, um, like I said, is always evolving and changing, starting with an awareness of how extreme we are in certain situations in our lives, with our thoughts, with our words, and our actions. But let me kind of go back to where this practice really comes from. Initially, for those who don't know, the Buddha was a prince. Um, he had all the wealth, all the riches, all the women, all the everything you could imagine as a prince did in India uh, growing up. And 29 years old, he snuck out in the middle of the night. He saw what's called the four sights, old age, sickness, and death. And then he saw an ascetic, like a, a nun or a monk, just someone living a simple life. And he went back to his buddy, I'm making this a very quick story, and he said, how can I live my whole life? with all this stuff when there's a world out there that suffers. So in the middle of the night, he sneaks out, he cuts off, he had long, beautiful, princely hair, which was custom of the times, and uh, he cut it all off, shaved his head, got rid of his fancy clothes, got a bunch of uh, cloth, sewed it together, 
put on a robe and live the exact opposite, ex roughly the exact opposite extreme of how he was living. They even went so far, him and the five buddies, to, uh, as the yogis did in India at that time, uh, they thought that if they overcame attachment to physical form, like the physical body, that that was the way to enlightenment, to awaken. So it's said that they lived on one grain of rice a day. And that's where the statue, I've told the story many times, but the statue behind me, it's called the Emaciated Buddha. That is him when they were near death, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, near death, um, living on one grain of rice a day. And he came to a riverbed and someone offered him food. And his buddies were like, no, 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 we can't eat, you know, we're trying to awaken, so we must starve ourselves to death, pretty much. And he said something to the effect of, well, I'm hungry. All right, don't quote me on that or anything for that matter, but uh, I cannot confirm nor deny that he said I'm hungry. Uh, so he took the bowl and he said, well, I'm going to put the bowl in the, stream, in, in the stream, right? They were by the river. And if the bowl goes against the stream, then I'm going to eat. So he puts the bowl in the stream, it goes against the stream, he begins to eat. And this is where you have really the, the initial kind of practice or uh, recognition of the middle path. Meaning that uh, the life of all the food in the palace and all that wasn't necessary. The life of, wanting, uh, of, of living or wanting only one grain of rice a day also wasn't necessary. Neither really healthy. So they found a balance. For him, at the time, the way they chose to live after that was they went out every morning. They would, it's called the alms round, they would beg for food and they would eat one meal a day. So for them, their middle path was eating one meal a day. That was all. Now, again, why the middle path changes, think about how much food. Not only do we consume, think about how much we waste. Right? We order so much food. Do you finish everything that's on your plate? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. These aren't judgments, these aren't critiques. This doesn't mean you're a bad Buddhist if you order food and throw it away. It's just an awareness of how much we consume and how much we waste. One of the practices in the monastery I thought was really beautiful was um, we would, uh, everything was in silent, right? You'd eat 20 minutes silent, there'd be a few thousand people there. And... Uh, you would first sit down and there'd be two, two bowls of food. One was kind of more like uh, solid foods and one was more of like a soup or, you know, something like that. And you had to eat everything was in the bowl. Now, if you wanted more food, that was fine. You would push the bowl forward and you would wait, you know, looking down to kind of, uh, uh, I want to say mimic for lack of better words, but the practice of begging for alms, you would push the bowl forward and you'd sit there waiting and then the people serving you would come, the monks or nuns or whoever was serving the food would come and put more food in the bowl. Now, you were welcome to do that, but the challenge was, or the challenge, at least for me, the practice was whatever went in that bowl, you had to eat it. And there were a lot of different things being served. Some of them you like, some of them you don't like. So you just had something that was really good. And then there's the risk of like, well, I want more. <laughs> I'm going to put the bowl out there. Maybe it'll be what I want. Maybe it's that stuff I don't like. So you take the gamble, you put the food out, it comes back, you're like, God, I don't like this food. But you got to eat it. <laughs> and then when you're done eating, you then took the soup or the liquid, whatever you had there, you poured it in the bowl, you took the chopstick, you scraped it around, you picked up the bowl, and you drank it. And then when you were done, you pushed the bowl back forward. Right? There were ways, it was like signs, you would put the chopsticks straight across the top, never in it. Asian cultures, if you don't know this, when you have chopsticks, don't stick them in your food. It symbolizes death. Little side note, just so you know. Right? So thank you all. Um, but uh, then when you were done, the bowl was just, you know, you still washed it, but it looked as if it was perfectly clean. Now, for me, this was a great practice because I grew up just eating whatever I wanted, ordering whatever I wanted. I don't like it, throw it away. Constant. All the clothes, all the food, whatever it was, just so much consumption. Now think about middle path with emotions, middle path with speech, middle path with um, physical things. How much stuff do we have? How extreme are we with our emotions? Right. 
the middle path can be applied to everything in our lives. I look at it as a balance. But important for each individual is to discover where in my life am I potentially out of balance or in such an extreme place. Um, this is where I come up with the great examples of you don't need 100 shirts, maybe get rid of 20 and see if you'll actually still live with 80 shirts. You'll probably be okay. You know, Same thing with food. Maybe you don't need to spend $30 on a meal. Maybe you could spend 10 and that $20 could go towards feeding somebody who has no food. Right? So we tend to live in these extremes. And again, these are not pointed out to say like you're a bad person for having extremes. But maybe those extremes have a big part and play in the ego, the pride, the me, 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 the craving, the desire. Right? I mean, I grew up thinking about all the money and all the houses and all the stuff that I'd be perfectly happy. So I got all the money and all the houses and all the stuff. And you know what? Now I had to worry about all the houses and all the money and all the stuff. And then I was even more depressed than I was before. <clears throat> so I got rid of it all. Also, it was not smart. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, I should have kept some of that. Would have been nice. You know? So, middle path, balance. Find in your lives where you're out of balance and uh, work on kind of bringing the scale back to the middle. Does that help? All right. Yeah, Tom. I think oh. the middle path also applies to our spiritual path. It's totally. Like the practice, because it's like we can get caught in um, feeling as if we aren't doing enough or feeling that how can I exist in this world and yet have a pure understanding of the principle mm -hmm. say, without you know feeling guilty for, like you said, eating too much or throwing yeah. food and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think the, for those who didn't hear, the, you, you were talking about the middle path also applying to spiritual practice and path 100%. I mean, for me, it applies to everything. But since you bring that up, that's so important to, and I'm kind of paraphrasing what you just said, but just to echo it for those who maybe didn't hear Super important for those who start or are in any sort of spiritual practice, whatever it might be, to not compare, right? We read these Pema Chodron, Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh books, and all of a sudden we're like, I'm going to do that. And then after two days of trying to do that, we were like, I can't do that. <laughs> and then we feel like we're just these failures, not healthy, right? So I look at it as... Uh, the, the cultivation, the aspiration to work towards certain things without judgment and critique. Otherwise, yes, you'll just feel like you're a failure and then surrender completely. You know? So baby steps, I think, is, is important without judgment and critique. Um, but also not, and I, you're not, I, I don't, I know you well enough to know you're not suggesting this, but just to throw it out there, also not using that as an excuse to say, well, that was great, but I'm still going to buy a bunch of shit I don't need. Mm -hmm. Still working towards it and an awareness of it. You know? Yeah, I saw a hand. Yeah. What other types of meditation are taught in this tradition in addition to the practice that you did this morning? Um, so the question was, what other types of meditation are practiced in this tradition in addition to the type we did this morning? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Many. Uh, to give it a little bit of context, one, I'm guessing this is your first time here. Great. Welcome. The good news is, if you hate me, if you don't like me, if you hated this meditation practice, which is very possible, there are different practices going on every night from different traditions. To specifically talk about when you said this lineage or this tradition, you said, um, we are not one tradition. So the Dharma Bhav Temple was started 17 years ago to actually introduce all, I say all loosely, there's a lot of weird Buddhist stuff out there that we stay away from, but most of the Buddhist traditions. So those of us who lead, we're not monks, we're not nuns, we're not lineage holders or tradition holders. We may have a specific personal practice, whether it's a Theravada, a Mahayana, a Zen practice, a Vajrayana, a Tibetan practice, whatever it might be. And those of us who lead will lead from our personal experience. But the temple is, is open to all the different um, Buddhist traditions. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, for me, I am more of a Zen and Pure Land uh, Buddhist practitioner. That's my personal practice. 
but that is also not what I led this morning. Um, so, yeah. And for new people, I always encourage, you know, that's why we have different people leading every night for the most part. Um, different personalities, different practices, different approaches, and that's healthy, right? I'm not a fan of like finding the guru that's going to tell you the way to be because um, they're probably, if not definitely just as unenlightened and ignorant as you are, no offense, but you know what I mean? We're all just walking each other home. I think Ram Dass, somebody said that, but uh, yeah. What else? What does it mean to be enlightened? I have no idea. And I'm not just being like humble or modest, right? And I also suggest you don't seek that. Um, the question was, what does it mean to be enlightened? Do you know what it means to be angry? Do you know what it means to be miserable? Do you know what it means to be depressed? Do you know what it means to be sad? Do you know what it means to be... Did I already say angry? Yeah. <laughs> so, be those things less... And you'll get closer to what it means to be enlightened. But similar to Tom's question, if we, the danger of really any spiritual journey, and specifically to Buddhist practices, are like, okay, life is suffering, and the practice is to awaken or be enlightened. And so we then may put this goal in place that says, well, you know, I got six months at this, how come I'm not enlightened yet? Right? Well, you're not enlightened yet because you put some construct and some box and some goal on it where the practice is not to try to strive to become anything. It's actually to be with your anger and your sadness and your misery and depression and to observe it for what it is, which is actually just temporary emotions that are coming and going. And they're not who you are. They're temporary emotions that are coming and going. Um, the Buddha's teaching specifically around enlightenment I love is he said that we are all or awakened uh, he said that we all are already awakened. We don't have to seek it. It's not outside of us. It's not a target. It's already within us. And the metaphor very often used is on a day like today, a cloudy day. Is the sun there? Can you see it? No. Why not? The clouds. When the clouds part, what do you see? The sun. So that sun is what they call bodhicitta, Buddha nature, the awakened being that is within all of us. The Buddha says we are all already awakened. We just got a lot of clouds. Right? Some more than others. The clouds are the three poisons in Buddhism. Greed, anger, ignorance. Our cravings, our desires, our attachments, all these things that trigger all these emotions I mentioned earlier. So the practice is to recognize greed, anger, and ignorance practice generosity, compassion, and wisdom, and then we begin to cultivate and become closer to being with our uh, awakened essence. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And it's um, not easy. You know? I mean, if you've been angry for 40 years, it's going to take more than three months to you know, get through it. But uh, it's a heck of a lot better than being angry for another 40 so it's a practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question here. Oh. Um, hi, Jeff. Uh, this is your friend, <coughs> Billy. Could you tell us the lesson of the elephant over your right shoulder? So, so this is Samantha Padra Bodhisattva. Um, bodhisattvas are the literal translation of Bodhisattva. Bodhi is awakened, Sattva is being. So they're awakened beings. And I like to look at Bodhisattvas kind of in a Western context, the way we see angels. Um, the Bodhisattva vows to be reborn life after life until all sentient beings are free from suffering. Uh, for those of you, which is probably the majority of people who don't believe or aren't, you know, into this whole rebirth thing. Uh, it's important, I think, as a practice to look at it as a rebirth of every moment or every day. Every day we wake up, we have an opportunity to make change in our lives and the lives of those around us. You know, the time of the Buddha, they all believed in rebirth or reincarnation or continuation of consciousness. 
In fact, back then, if you told them they had one life and they were going to heaven or hell, they would have thought you were kind of crazy. You know, this is 500 years before Christ, so very different time. Um, but that was the vow. You know, how many of you showed up today to make sure that all beings in all time and all space and all directions are free from suffering? Or how many of you showed up? I don't need to show of hands. I already know the answer to this question. Or how many of you showed up just because you're miserable and you're trying to get your shit figured out? <laughs> right? That's the reality. Both are important. You're miserable, you want your shit figured out, and oh, by the way, if you're less miserable and you figure out stuff, other people will benefit. So they go hand in hand regardless. Even if your intention was not here to save all sentient beings from all their suffering, if you're here because you want to make your life happier and healthier, that's a beautiful thing to do because others will thank you for it, right? So Samantha Padra is the Bodhisattva of great diligence, great practice, great effort. Uh, the six tusks are uh, the six, represent the six paramitas, which for me the entire body of this practice is the practice of the paramitas, that's the, the bodhisattva practice. And that is generosity, morality, patience, diligence, concentration, and wisdom. So that's putting these six practices um, into your life. So Samantha Padra represents great effort, great diligence, which is one of the, you know, one of the Eightfold Path, um, and the six paramitas. Uh, to continue to practice generosity, morality, patience, um, diligence, concentration, and wisdom. Um, yeah. Don't be lazy with anything. I'm always amazed how diligent we can be at watching Netflix. <laughs> You know, you could bang through like eight episodes, you know, three of them you had to pee, but you didn't want to get up and go pee, right? Or you just bring your iPad with you so you don't have to pause it, you know, you're about to find out, it's all right, they're so diligent that, you know, Netflix, thanks to, you know, you're four seasons into it, you know? And then it's like, well, let's be diligent with our spiritual practice. So, okay, I've done that for seven minutes, I'm done. So, you know, diligence, we, we all have the ability to, to be really... Uh, diligent and, and put in effort. But right effort is looking at things that, you know, and I, I'm a Netflix watcher too, I'm not, I mean, I talk from personal experience, so I'm not uh, putting down Netflix. It's just an example of um, right effort is, in this context, is putting diligence and right effort into things that will help us suffer less. And I get it, knowing what happens at the end of the Netflix episode will help you suffer less, but not my point. <laughs> so... I hope that's helpful, Billy. Uh, what else? Thoughts, questions? Yeah. Um, I was just kind of thinking about some ideas that you brought up and thinking about like the middle path and thinking about trying to, there's a couple of questions in here, but trying to like find, is there a middle path when it comes to like being kind and being generous and doing those things? We were driving the other day and I was like, when do I stop letting people in? Because people behind me are getting pissed, but I'm trying to be nice to all the other people. And I know that's like a concrete example, but like, how do you navigate those? And then I was also thinking about like, in that same vein, what is the like Buddhist and or your philosophy on altruism? Because a lot of times I think like, well, I'm doing these things to be nice, but I'm doing it to be nice to make myself feel better, not because it's the nice thing to do. And like getting all muddled up in that. Yeah, great things to be muddled up in. <laughs> you know, how long have you been at this path in practice? Ballpark it. I mean, a handful of months. Okay. Much better things to get muddled up in than you probably were muddled up in two years ago. The fact that you're literally like, and we've all been there, okay? You're, I experience it constantly with um, coming out this alley here, right? So you're coming down Washington, you're at the alley, and... There's one of my favorites. I swear I could write a whole book on like Buddhism and driving. One of my favorites. And you've all, I know you've been there. Many of you, some of you, if not all of you, right? So the question of, and then I'll actually come back to it, but I want to point this out because this is something to watch. The question of, uh, you're, you're headed down, again, I'm using that street as an example, but it could be anywhere. You're headed down and there's a car that you want to let out of the parking lot or the alley or whatever it is. And normally you wouldn't especially if the light's green. But if the light's red, then you'll slow down and let them out because you got to stop anyways. So you were going to let them out, but now that the light turned red, then you let them out and then you feel good. But if it was green, you would have kept going, right? Um, it's kind of like the people that add things on their checklist just to 
after it's done just to check it off to get that endorphin rush of checking something off, you know? Um, to your question, when do you let... So there's a couple things at play here. One is control. The, the reason I bring that, this up is, and there's a fine line here between balance, awareness, control. So your specific example of, okay, I'm letting these people go, but I'm also pissing off the people behind me. So there's a lot of control stuff going on there. I don't have an answer for you. I'm just letting you know that there's a lot of control there. You're trying to control which stranger in the vehicle is happier with you <laughs> in that moment. You don't know the people behind you, and you don't know the people going in front of you, but you're trying to control or uh, with awareness. Again, I'm not suggesting this is bad. Um, so somebody asked my master once, do you ever feel like people take advantage of you? And he laughed, and he smiled, and he looked at them, and he said, yes all the time without any concern because the ultimate practice this won't necessarily help you with which card you let go or which one you piss off but the ultimate practice is it's not about you and for him he felt it the greatest honor to always be of service to the people that was his entire existence that's why he did what he did. Now, again, I can't solve the dilemma of which one, but coming to the kind of altruism part, um, one, I still think it's great that you're aware of that. Like, you know, do you let one go? Do you let two go? What's the number? What do you end up doing? I'm curious, actually. I don't know. And this, and, do you yeah. want to answer? <laughs> How does it play out? Uh, at least it depends on how heavy the traffic is. Yeah. Yeah, I think just the awareness of it. And what was the last thing you said? That's how key. much of a rush you're in. Too. How much of a rush you're in. So our personal emotions play into it also. If you're in a good mood at that moment, maybe you let three or four cars go. If you're in a bad mood, maybe you don't let any go. If you're feeling sad and you want to feel good about yourself, maybe you let a couple go because they can see you. The people behind you can't see you. So even though they're pissed off, you can't see them, but you get the smile, you get the way, you get that satisfaction from the stranger. It's Actually, a good job. Huh? <laughs> she's from the South, and if she doesn't get the way, then that trigger is <laughs> well, Now what? Then you get the resentment? There's a resentment of like, we didn't do the... Yeah. Well, what did being from the South have to do with it? <laughs> because you always do. Everybody in the South. Right? Let's you go. No, it no. You, yeah. They have to like, Oh, they give you the way. Yes. Gotcha. Oh, so if you don't get the wave, then you get mad. Yeah. Uh, so again, a lot of conditions, a lot of strings, a lot of attachments around, right? And this is great. And this all ties into, one, I think it's the awareness of this situation is phenomenal. Just to be aware of like, man, this is going on. This is really weird. But uh, the recognition of if I don't get that uh, reward, I've done something kind, the bodhisattva practice, no gift, no giver, no receiver. So the practice would be to let people go, forget about the people behind you for a minute, but let people go and see if the person who doesn't wave, if that won't impact you. Try to be like, maybe they're going to the hospital. Maybe they're on the way to have the baby delivered. Maybe someone, they just died and they're rushing to go see them. If we can take it away from it being about us, right? Again, no gift, no giver, no receiver. Buddha taught very clearly about generosity. True generosity from Buddha's teachings. Pleasant before, pleasant during, and pleasant after. No strings attached to it. I can't even tell you how many people give things and like want something in return from it, right? We give them the lane. We want them to wave back at us. Now, if you're from the South and you've been conditioned that way, it's going to be harder to <laughs> overcome that, right? But altruism here, and I'm going to kind of close with this thought. Uh, this question comes up a lot around, for example, here with the food redistribution program. Very often people will say, hey, I, you know, I, I participate in any really sort of community service or, or you know, uh, work that you might do. People say, well, I'm doing it because it makes me feel good. Is that wrong? It's not wrong. It's not bad. This is just my, obviously my, all this is my opinion. It's not bad to help people 
and feel good from it. And in fact, even if it's the only reason you're doing it, that's still a great start. Ultimately, the cultivation with time and with practice, you begin to see like, wow, it's not about me anymore. And my actions to help others ultimately shouldn't have such a, a, an impact on how I feel. Right? I remember 20 years ago, I started doing prison work, and I was miserable, and depressed, and angry. But after two weeks of the temple, my master, she said, go do prison work. I left there feeling like I had no problems in the world. And I did that for like three years just because it made me feel good. They also benefited. Ultimately, I just then felt better about my life overall, not because I was being of service to the people in prison, but it goes back to what Meredith commented on earlier. When you start to feed and nurture and cultivate these kind of positive, beautiful practices, then all the negative stuff starts to decrease. And then you're just feeding people or letting them go just to let them go. You might be an hour and a half late. <laughs> right? So, yeah. That's the best response I got with no answer. Um, no gift, no giver, no receiver. Don't attach. Don't expect. That's the practice. Don't give with strings attached. The, the practice is to not give with strings attached. To not give expecting something in return. Because if you give expecting something in return, not only is it not true generosity, in many cases you're also going to be incredibly disappointed. You know? So, I'm going to close on that. Um, not sure I quite understand this, but I'm going to share it anyways. A wise man once said, for a person who's seen every Muppet movie, I'm amazed at your lack of ambition. Um, understood yeah so that's all I got so we'll join palms <laughs> and the benefit of this practice be shared with all beings in all directions may all beings be at peace may all be free from suffering may any merit gained from this practice be transferred to those who need it most announcements. Um, thanks all for showing up. My name is Jeff. I'm a Dharma bum. Uh, we opened up this temple 17 years ago to introduce Buddhist practice to those who show up. Uh, those of us who lead, we're not monks, we're not nuns, we're not gurus, we're not masters, we're not teachers, we're not looking for students. We're just practitioners. Uh, we share, as I mentioned earlier, we share our own interpretation of Buddhist practice coming from various traditions. Uh, also, as I mentioned, every Thursday at 4.30, we do a food redistribution, pro redistribution program. I think it's one of the best things around here. We prepare gourmet vegetarian meals, also known as peanut butter and jelly, and we feed people soup on the street. So anytime you think your life sucks and you really lack gratitude, um, just go feed people, and it tends to put things into perspective. Um, first Saturday of the month, we have a half day of silence. That'll be next Saturday. Uh, so it's four hours of silence. The first three hours, most of it is up here, and then it finishes downstairs. Um, so even though we have a Saturday at 11, that's from 8 to noon. Uh, if you've never done four hours of silence, I highly recommend it. Um, if 20 minutes of silence is torture for you, then definitely do four hours of silence. Um, it makes 20 minutes just that much easier. So um, thanks all for being here. Please travel safe. Let as many cars in front of you as you can. One last car practice for you before you head out there. When you're driving and you're in the right lane or if there's any lane and there's a car to your left and the car in front of you slows down to park or do whatever, I want everybody to know it is actually possible to just stop and wait <laughs> for them to do what they have to do and not swerve to the left. You could just take 60 seconds and let the person park or turn or whatever they're doing without cutting off the person to your left. I don't think most people know that, so I just want to point that out. Buddha for you is there. If you need anything downstairs, thank you all.